the topic is SCL Quo Vadis. Where are we going uh, with a specific view on end-to-end -end engineering? End-to-end -end is uh, maybe a very generic term. There are several topics that could conceivably be covered by this description, and we're going to talk about at least two of them. But uh, first, we're going a little bit back to the warm-up, and uh, thanks to Thomas for also introducing some more details on SCL, that will be useful here. Um, the system configuration language is the XML dialect that we use to exchange data between tools and also in the human readable format. And uh, the three major players that want to exchange data are the system specification tool, system integration tool, and the multiple IED configuration tools. Uh, each of these files, uh, ovals, are file types that are used during the engineering process, contain a subset of the possible information that SCL can contain. So in the specification, system specification description, you will find information on the electrical process, but also on the data that is used in the form of logical node references. The SCD file then augments the specification and the electrical process with actual intelligent electronic devices that uh, uh, implement the electrical process. There is something that people who are familiar with 61 and 50 may not immediately recognize. The ISD is a proposed new file type in the works. Uh, ISD is uh, the ID specification description, so it's um, a description file that you can use to vet if a given IED is matching your requirements and is useful in, uh, for example, negotiating frame agreements or in uh, uh, acquisitions. Um, apart from the ISD files, there are multiple extensions regarding SCL that uh, are in active development and uh, I'm going to talk about these in the end-to-end -end data flow engineering. This will be the first end-to-end -end action. For this, what is the data flow? Well, one end that we are looking at is the electrical process itself. So here we have the primary equipment which consumes and produces sensor and actor data. And on the other side, we have the operators with the displays. They, have, uh, they consume <coughs> the information from the electrical process and they issue commands that then go back to the electrical process. On this way, we can trace some of the possible paths that such a signal can take, both in the runtime, but also, of course, as part of the engineering process. So, up here, we still have the electrical process, and our first stop will be this IED that is acting as a server publisher. Well, now we are treating it as a black box, or maybe a bluish box instead. And uh, we have up here several ways for data to go from the electrical process into the 61850 world. So all the way to the left we have wired I.O., which is exactly what you imagine it to be. Actual wires that start at the primary equipment and end up in a terminal block <coughs> in the device. There may also be devices that communicate via any field bus, Modbus or Ethercat which are also information that is relevant to be received on the other end of the engineering. And uh, finally, we may also have intelligent sensors that are already 61850 aware. In this case, they may have a voltage transformer that is <coughs> publishing a sample value stream that can then be read via the process bus. When we have the data in 
an IED acting as a server or publisher. You already know there are several ways how IEC 61850 communicates this data. We have uh, reports, goose, and sample values, and uh, with these mechanisms we can go in a horizontal step to other devices on the same level, or we can have vertical communication to a gateway or other client, which finally ends up at the HMI or network control center. Now let's uncover the blue boxes a little bit and look at the internals. So this is of course not a comprehensive or complete possibility for how every kind of communication works. It's an example. So our wired signal here may, for example, be a circuit breaker position, a switch gear position. And in this case, the associated logical node would be an access WI, and uh, the current position of the circuit breaker is, it's already been mentioned several times in uh, the last talk, uh, would be the position data object and within there the status value. Um, another possibility would be a logic node, the general APC logic container, where we define the inputs, process them, and uh, then publish the resulting output. Or we could have a protection function, in this guy is a time over voltage, that uses external references to refer to data in this TVTR and uh, provides uh, tripping information there. So all of this is then published via data sets and control blocks. The mechanisms are familiar from the warm-up, I hope, uh, and sent across the station bus to the relevant participants. The network control center is, of course, rarely located within the local area network of the substation, so there needs to be some translation of protocol. Common use are 104, DMP3, and obviously there needs to be some kind of translation from the 61850 communication to wide area networks. So right from this we can see from one end to the other, we're not actually doing everything in SCL. We can't. So some of them are very obvious uh, missing pieces, and some of them may not be quite as obvious. So I'm going to talk about the, some areas that are not, or rather not yet, in the scope of 61850. Um, you may wonder why there is this suspicious empty space over here, and why is it red? That seems to be a perfectly good connection. But uh, there is actually no description in SCL that allows you to figure out which input or which output is connected to the internal logical node of the device. To do that, you have to retrieve your vendor manual and look up that information in the relevant chapter. And there is a proposal to introduce boundary logical node classes, so they would be in the class L, the system node class, and uh, the LPDI in here, there is a bit more of an example, I propose to organize exactly this information. So their data attributes would be physical or electrical properties of the switch, like a rise up voltage or a rebounds uh, emitters. And uh, in a properly designed system, you would have an intermediate between the circuit breaker controller and the actual circuit breaker, the switch gear trip coil and close coil. And uh, in this way, with, with this proposed node, you can model the entire uh, chain from the electrical outlet at the primary equipment to the controlling device. So, the next red circle red circle we're looking at is 
the logic container, JAPC, we can define very well what kind of inputs we are giving this node and uh, the, uh, where to send the output, but there is uh, nothing provisioned in STL to actually describe the logic that this container is uh, using or executing. And uh, again, this is something that is about to change. The 61850-90-11 uh, describes the logic modeling. So there is a technical report, both uh, uh, with, for the methodologic, methodology and uh, uh, how to link the 61850 inputs to the inputs of the logic plans or logic diagrams. And uh, this description can either be placed in separate files as a reference within SCL, or it can also be inlined as an XML foreign namespace element. So next up is the field bus connection. So the 61850 80-5 allows us to uh, map Modbus so that 61850 aware clients can use it. So um, there are guidelines how to map the data to the data classes in 61850. The data interoperability is very important to interpret the data that is sent your way. And there is also uh, a scheme to translate the Modbus devices into uh, something that is accessible from the gateway that is acting as the Modbus master. So as you can see in this diagram, we have uh, the physical device gateway over here on the right. And there are yellow boxes inside and each of these represents the communication or rather it transparently proxies the data and the uh, services of the one Modbus device. In this way, Clients can communicate and query and operate uh, devices via proxy of the uh, gateway without needing to speak Modbus themselves. There is uh, also a, a, a provision to, to map the Modbus device profile as a description in an SCL file. So, the next point looks very nauseous, but it's actually a fairly, fairly large uh, piece of work. The station HMI is usually not, or the engineering of the station HMI is not connected intimately to the engineering process of the station. It's often done by a separate team uh, after, after the, the main engineering is complete and uh, it has a very little connection to SCL itself. Engineers need to parse uh, the files and uh, figure out both the graphical representation and the binding. The 6-2 uh, group works on configuration description language for HMI, and there's also the 90-18 for the alarm handling. In this section, there is a description of a graphical configuration language that is also XML-based and a configuration language that binds the data and the semantics from 61850 to the graphical representation in the GCL. So, with this binding, the HMI itself <coughs> is operable. Engineering process is uh, uh, extended in uh, quite a clever way to enable both bottom-up and top-down approaches. So top-down still is uh, a bit unpopular, I'd say uh, not entirely justified due to misconceptions, but uh, uh, there is a good, uh, a strong push to also have a bottom-up enabled as seamlessly as the top-down. So, lastly, we have uh, the connections 
to the network control center. And uh, in this case, I uh, added both the 104 and the DNP3 as a, a single uh, point. They are not entirely related. Um, there is the 80-1 binding to the 104. 104 is IEC 870-5-104, the entire name. And uh, the DNP standard is not a European, but a IEEE 1815.1. And uh, these documents describe both use cases and typical architectures, but also mapping services to go from the data in 61850 to the data representation as DNP3 and 104. And again, these documents also describe how to map this information directly into SCL. So this allows a fully formed SCL file to contain aspects of the engineering process that were previously only available as reference in text documentation uh, that describes the protocol mapping. And uh, so many independent areas of engineering are brought together. The second set of ends that we want to look at is the end-to-end -end engineering process. Because just as the data flow engineering does not stop, does begin with SCL and end with SCL, <coughs> the engineering process also starts before the first SCL file is ever created, and it certainly doesn't stop when an SCD file is finalized. Uh, especially given that you've just heard Thomas talk about the testing on the finished files, maintenance. And uh, a big part of this is that stations are rarely built in a vacuum. You have uh, best practices, engineering standards, you may have restrictions on which IEDs you use because there are pre-negotiated frame agreements. You may wish to pursue specific frame agreements uh, to have your substations more in line with your engineering standards. And uh, these are not typically or never in SCL. For one, SCL doesn't actually have the provisions yet to, uh, to accommodate all this information, but also because asset management systems do not know SCL. So often this data is in uh, common information uh, model, SIM. And uh, from there, to go to the system specification and the system integration, the engineering standards need to be translated into SCL, need to be uh, to take care of uh, the best practices and of uh, expected uh, uh, outcomes so that uh, stations with similar functions are also similarly configured and more importantly uh, accessible to engineers that are or operators that are familiar with one kind of station it's easier to work with similar stations so there is the 61850 6-100 group on function modeling and uh, its purpose is to bring more communication information into the SSD file. So before, in edition one especially, communication and data flow is found only in an SCD file. Communication and data flow is something that IEDs do. IEDs publish, IEDs receive, and the SSD only contains reference to the data that is used in the form of logical nodes. Now these can be bound to the data in the IED to signify this IED implements this functionality of the electrical process, but there is no sense of communication in the SSD file. So with addition two, um, there uh, are some changes to this, and the function modeling uh, adds even more uh, information on the data flow. So with the extensions to this group, uh, let me see, there is an extension. Yeah. 
there are uh, possibilities to define and specify functions that are no longer uh, a single block, but may be distributed over several IEDs. Um, there are provisions to have uh, the functions organized in categories as recognized by SCL. And uh, there are also uh, application schemes that is um, predefined signal flow from, let's say, an XCBR device to a protection device. Uh, sorry, to a protection node. We do not have any devices in the specification, uh, which allows you to configure your processes without actually having to use a specific IED, which means you can do this in stages beyond the uh, engineering of a single substation project. So this, of course, means that standards can also be enforced or maintained separately of projects and uh, substations following these standards will have very similar outcomes. Lastly, the concept of the virtual IEDs. I already mentioned the ISD file at the very first part. Uh, uses these data flow and function allocation in the specification to, uh, in a formal way, describe what an IED, what capabilities an IED has to offer to uh, be able to be used in this capacity. So the ISD files, uh, if they are done well, can be used uh, for procurement and uh, as a no negotiation uh, frame agreements or to bind system integrators to uh, choose the proper IEDs as intended by the utility. Merci. We have the group 10-3, functional testing. I do believe Alex is the chairman of this group. Shh. Sorry, no, no, no. Um, it's a, uh, the group uh, defines a method, met, methodical approach to verify and uh, validate a substation solution. So there are testing practices established and recommended and uh, the uh, the the, pro the the test process uh, uh, uses uh, the communication instead of the hardwired system interfaces. So this uh, is uh, something that uh, we will also see in the uh, Omicron uh, work demonstration workshop demonstration. Lastly, we have brought uh, an engineering demonstration. So all of the topics that I superficially glanced over here are not just uh, somewhere on paper in an ivory tower on a green field. They are in use. And uh, there is, uh, in the workshop demonstration, we have a project that uh, shows many of the aspects. And uh, ourselves, we contributed uh, the multi-vendor engineering. So this is a diagram of the devices that are in use in this project. So there are four bays, each with two or three devices. And as you can see from the front plates that are used to display the devices, uh, there are many different vendors and makes involved. The project also features a uh, gateway configuration that is very nifty. You can find this at uh, InfoTeam's demonstration. The virtual IED uh, generated from our tool works with the smart RTU from InfoTeam. And uh, the HMI configuration in the scheme that I discussed earlier, this is uh, a way to automatically generate a working and a layouted HMI uh, okay. as part of the engineering process. And uh, you can see the demonstration of this at the Xenon station. 
And uh, last but not least, Omicron is simulating with Station Scout and uh, show you how testing and simulation interacts in such an environment.